Hello students and welcome back to your last video lecture of the semester. Uh, today we're finishing up with Weber, so we're finishing up with the Protestant ethic. So if you recall from last week, um, basically Weber is trying to figure out if religion has any impact on the kind of wealth that people amass and specifically on the kind of jobs that they do and the way that they feel about those jobs. Um, so again, he was talking about more of like a Calvinist Protestantism, which is where um, your fate has already been predetermined and you have to sort of prove to everyone else that God loves you by being successful. Um, and he was comparing that with Catholicism. And I think for a lot of you that was confusing because we don't necessarily practice Protestantism that way anymore. Um, but basically his argument um, in the first chapter was that Protestants look at the world differently, they look at education and earning differently, and therefore they're a little bit more successful at capitalism. So what we're going to do today um, is look at why he thinks that might be. So we're going to go through chapter two. Chapter two is called The Spirit of Capitalism. Um, and spirit is kind of a controversial choice for this translation. Um, in German, it's Geist, which is sort of like a ghost or sort of like a, like spirit's not a bad word for it, but it's kind of interesting. So it's sort of like the, the ethic of capitalism, the... Um, whole of capitalism, the like meaning of capitalism. It's The spirit is kind of an interesting choice, but in case you were wondering, that's why. So he starts by defining the spirit of capitalism, very handy. In the title of this study is used the somewhat pretentious phrase, the spirit of capitalism. What is to be understood by it? The attempt to give anything like a definition of it brings out certain difficulties, which are the very nature of this type of investigation. So it's kind of nice that he uh, realizes that he's being pretentious. We never see that. Um, but basically he's saying, well, I don't know either. Um, he's saying I have chosen this phrase, the spirit of capitalism, but I'm not 100% sure what it means. And the reason he's not sure what it means um, is because he hasn't really started to study it yet. So this is an interesting way of looking at science, but let me clear what he says first. A complex of elements associated in historical reality, which we unite into a conceptual whole from the standpoint of their cultural significance. Ah, so that's quite a definition, no? Uh, it, it's, it's cloudy, and he knows it's cloudy. Um, he says that basically we're looking at elements for sure. We're looking at a series of elements, a complex of elements. Um, and we're interested in their historical reality. Like this part is, is scientifically accurate in the sense that we're looking at tangible evidence. We're looking at historical reality that goes, um, you know, further back than our current generation. And he's going to basically use the elements that he's named, the reality that he can measure, and from there make a conceptual whole. Hope that makes sense. But the problem here um, is what he says next. Thus, the final and definitive concept cannot stand at the beginning of the investigation, but must come at the end. So he's saying he can't tell you what um, the capitalist spirit is at the beginning. He has to examine it first. He has to compare his elements and his reality. He has to, you know, go through the process of scientific organization. And then at the end, he'll tell us what it is. And this is frustrating because we're used to uh, reading, especially scientific literature that knows what it's going to say from the beginning. Uh, but this was, remember, the very beginning of social science. Like he was one of the sort of inventors of social science. So for him to open by saying that he doesn't know where we're going to end is in a weird way kind of brave. So as part of his examination of capitalism, he pauses for a minute to talk about what other people have said about money and about earning. Um, and specifically, he turns to Benjamin Franklin, which is kind of fun. Benjamin Franklin was always full of excellent one-liners. So let's see what Benjamin Franklin said. Um, he said a lot of things that are going to sound familiar to you, I think. Um, Benjamin Franklin was pretty obsessed with interest and with money earning money. So he said a lot of things about uh, money being prolific, money being generating. Benjamin Franklin thought that you shouldn't amass your wealth and then like look at it, that you should use your wealth as a means to get more wealth or as a means to improve something about your life. Um, so he believed that basically, number one, you needed to design your life in such a way that you would earn money. Uh, time is money. Don't waste a lot of time. Don't waste a lot of education. Don't waste a lot of job experience. Only focus on money. But he also believed um, that you needed to be a man of honor, uh, that your word needed to mean something, um, and because your honor led to your ability to be loaned money. 
So essentially, he wasn't saying that you needed to be good for goodness sake. He was saying that you needed to be good so that people would give you money. Um, so when he says, remember that credit is money, he means that you have access to as much money as people are willing to lend you. Um, and when he says the most trifling actions that affect a man's credit are to be regarded, he means that if you do a bunch of stuff that people don't approve of, they're not going to be willing to lend you money. And then you have no money. Um, so basically, he thinks that we need to be smart about money, but part of being smart about money is being smart about who you are in such a way that people will continue to trust you. So the thing that's interesting about this is that it's very utilitarian. Um, again, Benjamin Franklin is not saying that you should just be a nice person. He's saying that you need to be an honorable person so that people will give you money. Um, and so to Vapor, this is kind of a weird thought. Vapor kind of thinks it's it's a little bit crass, perhaps, but definitively utilitarian. He says, now all Franklin's moral attitudes are colored with utilitarianism. Honesty is useful because it assures credit. So are punctuality, industry, frugality, and that is the reason they are virtues. So he's, he's connecting virtue to money. Uh, instead of having virtue for virtue's sake, you are virtuous in the name of earning more money. And this is a very Protestant thing and ultimately a very American thing. Um, this idea that a good person is rewarded, uh, that you, you know, if you are on time and you work hard while you're at work, you're going to earn a lot of money. Um, and this is, I think, at the root of capitalism, this idea that the harder you work, the more money you'll get. So for Weber, he's basically saying, yes, there's a, there's a relationship between virtue and money, but there hasn't always been, and we need to examine why there suddenly is. Why do we suddenly believe that good people deserve money out of all things? So he calls it a peculiar ethic. Truly, what is here preached is not simply a means of making one's way in the world, but a peculiar ethic. The infraction of the rules is treated not as foolishness, but as forgetfulness of duty. That is the essence of the matter. It is not mere business astuteness. That sort of thing is common enough. It is an ethos. This is the quality that interests us. So essentially he's saying, yeah, making money is one thing. Like that's, you know, a, a practical thing. Uh, that's a matter of business astuteness. This thing where you connect money to virtue, that's weird. That's an ethos. Um, and so an ethos, by the way, is sort of like an ethical code uh, that you live by. And so he's saying this idea that you're connecting behaving well and earning money is, is weird and it's new and I want to explore it. Man is dominated by the making of money, by acquisition as the ultimate purpose of his life. Economic acquisition is no longer subordinated to man as the means of satisfaction of his material needs. So again, here he's, he's tracing this shift. Um, we used to earn as much money as we needed to stay alive. Now we are obsessed with the making of money, this obsessed with the acquisition of money. So he's saying we have changed, that there's been a massive change, largely by merit of this massive social change. And he wants to know why we are suddenly so obsessed with the acquisition of money. He does note, uh, as part of this exploration, that this is kind of unusual, um, this, this obsession with the acquisition. He says it is foreign to all peoples not under capitalistic influence. And this is not a wholly true thought, right? Like this, this idea that people are obsessed with, with collecting money. We've seen that in other cultures before in other periods of history. But this idea that a, a, a mounting a fortune means that you're a good person, that part is new, this tie to virtue. So the question becomes, all right, well, then how did we get here? Like if we have this ethos that the earning of money is equal to the being a good person, like what was the path that got us here? Why are we here if no one else is? So he thinks, well, maybe it goes back to the Bible. After all, we're talking about uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. So he's like, well, maybe they read this in the Bible and they thought the Bible said you should be rich. But the problem here is that there's, you know, a few verses that support that, and there's a bunch of verses that don't. So he picks this one uh, verse from Proverbs. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. And so he's, he starts to sort of analyze this Bible verse. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that it, it suggests that a person who's good at business will stand before kings. But whether that suggests that he will be wealthy or whether that suggests that he will be virtuous is kind of two different things, you know? Like he's diligent, but does that mean he's earning? Or he's diligent and that means he's a good person. So let's keep going with this idea. 
he says that a essentially we combined our religious ideas with our capitalistic ideas by calling it um, what, what the Christians at the time were calling, I'm using the word calling a lot, but we're calling a calling. Um, so your calling is sort of your divine purpose. Like a lot of people would argue that God would tell you directly what your calling was. A lot of people say, you know, you should pray about it. Sometimes the elders tell you. Um, but this idea of having a calling is, is not new, but the idea, again, that you'd be making money from your calling is new. So here's what he says. The earning of money within the modern economic order is, so long as it is done legally, the result and expression of virtue and a proficiency in a calling. So again, no longer is it enough to have a calling, now you have to earn a bunch of money at it. One's duty in a calling is what is most characteristic of the social ethic of capitalistic culture, and it is in a sense the fundamental basis of it. So when he's talking about your, your duty being the fundamental basis of it, he's saying your work is not just work. Um, your work is your duty. It is your duty to God. It is your duty to yourself, to your family. Um, and this is a major shift, again, in how we think about jobs. Because previously it was like, okay, maybe you're a baker, but like that means you make the bread for your town, but it doesn't mean that you make the bread for God. Um, but what we're seeing now is that people are tying their work ethic to their religiosity. So they're saying, I work hard because I'm Christian, or I work hard because I love God. And this may sound kind of familiar. We see this a lot in modern athletes. They talk about, um, you know, scoring touchdowns for God. Uh, so this is kind of a similar idea, this idea that, that God told you what to do. And if you do it and you are successful, it's your way of sort of communicating with God, your way of, of proving your religiosity, of proving that you have a calling. So it's not a job anymore. It's a calling. You have to do it. You're called to do it. Uh, God likes it when you do it, and you earn a bunch of money. So that's the important part here. Um, and this, again, is very, very tied to Calvinism. So for Calvinists, um, when you are born, God has already decided if you're going to hell or heaven. And so you have no way of knowing. You just have to assume it's heaven, and also you have to behave as though it's heaven. So you have to like be a perfect Christian so that other people look at you and they're like, wow, what a good Christian, so that other people and you believe that you must be destined for heaven. Uh, because if you were unlucky, it must mean that God doesn't like you and therefore you were destined to hell. But if you're lucky, it must mean that God likes you and is doing good things. So essentially, if you were a good Christian, you were given a calling by God and you were given success. So in that way, your work ethic and your job were tied directly to your religiosity. Um, and again, sometimes we see this, hashtag blessed, right? Uh, this idea that God likes you and that's why he made you wealthy. So this is the part uh, that I think is really interesting because this is where it begins to sort of transition from purely a religious ethic into a capitalistic ethic. A conscious acceptance of these ethical maxims on the part of individuals, entrepreneurs, or laborers in modern capitalistic enterprises is a condition of the further existence of present-day capitalism. So what he's arguing here is that you wouldn't even participate in capitalism unless you believed this to be true. Because why would you participate in a system where you work really hard and get nothing? That doesn't make any sense. I know the underlying joke here is, of course, that we do it every day, but... What he's saying is capitalism is a terrible system for people who aren't benefiting. Therefore, if you participate, you must be believing that you will benefit. Um, you must get up and work hard, um, you know, get out there in the world and try to get that bread as a measure of what a good person you are. So this idea that entrepreneurs especially, that, that laborers especially, um, want to work hard all day, get that bread, grind, 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 is basically a reflection of their godliness. So this is something that we took really seriously in America. We love hard work. We love the grind. We love people who work hard and are on that grind, who are getting that bread, um, because we've transitioned our idea of sort of like what a good Christian was into what a good worker is. So for Vapor, these two things are still tied, but I will argue later that we've separated them. Also, I love this Baskin-Robbins picture. So... The other problem with a sort of capitalist economy is that very often we are born into it and we start working within it before we really realize what's going on. So he says the capitalistic economy of the present day is an immense cosmos into which the individual is born and which presents itself to him, at least as an individual, as an unalterable order of things in which he must live. 
So for those of you who have struggled with this idea that you have to work until you die um, or that you're going to be paid hourly according to your physical abilities, it started here, man. This is it. Uh, he's saying that you are born into this capitalist economy and it's unalterable. And if you want to survive, you better get on board. Uh, basically, that you, sh you should be this baby with a job. <laughs> um, that this this is not optional, uh, that it's, it starts when you're born and ends when you die, that we are all part of the system. And basically, it's it's a controlling thing. It's a multifaceted thing. It's in different parts of our lives, but it starts and it's unavoidable. So one great example of this is what happens when you don't participate. Because he recognizes that not everybody's going to be able to participate uh, in this kind of capitalism, and that also not everyone's going to want to. But he says that the problem with this form of capitalism is that it only benefits the people at the top. Thus, the capitalism of today, which has come to dominate economic life, educates and selects the economic subjects which it needs through a process of economic survival of the fittest. So if you don't participate in this capitalism, you're screwed. Like, just go on. Uh, if you do participate in capitalism, you might have success. But basically, those are your only two options. Participate and fail. Uh, or sorry, participate and succeed. Or don't participate and fail. So one question that we do have to ask ourselves is if everyone in the society was doing the same thing uh, and if essentially everybody was okay with the shift. And it's important to recognize that no, they weren't. Uh, this idea that we would just change the way that we thought about jobs and about money and about religion was very shocking to a lot of people, and they were not in favor. So he says, The spirit of capitalism, in the sense in which we are using the term, had to fight its way to supremacy against a whole world of hostile forces. So the hostile forces that he's talking about um, are largely social. This was against previous religious teachings. This was against the previous uh, sort of social teachings. This is, you know, contrary to their way of life. Um, he notes that in previous times it would have been described as, quote, the lowest sort of avarice and as an attitude entirely lacking in self-respect. Uh, so this sort of relates back to his explanation of capitalism and how he said it was meant to be um, a logical, a formal, um, you know, a peaceful process. And similarly, work was meant to be, you know, calm and peaceful. And so this idea that you would work to live um, is new and it's gross and uh, it's a little bit tacky. He does also specify that acquisition for the sake of acquisition is not new. Um, he notes that at all periods of history, wherever it was possible, there has been ruthless acquisition bound to no ethical norms whatsoever. Um, and of course, this is true. Uh, we, we have lots of tales of pirates and Vikings and you know pillaging and the, the accumulation of things, not new. It's just that the accumulation of things as related to God's favor is new. So Part of it being new is that we're going to have a big social change. So this is when he starts to talk about traditionalism, uh, which is luckily exactly what it sounds like. It's people who really like the traditional way of life and want to stay that way. He says the most important opponent with which the spirit of capitalism has had to struggle was that type of attitude and reaction to new situations, which we may designate as traditionalism. So he's casting a sort of a negative light on traditionalism. Um, this is an interesting thing that we deal with every few generations. Um, should we stick with the way that things used to be, or should we go and do something new? And as I'm sure you've noticed, uh, very often the older people want to stick with the way that things are or the way that things used to be, and the younger people want to do something new. But he's also st sort of staging it as um, like a modern, sort of not modern, as a progressive be not progressive. So his, he's arguing that people who struggle with new situations um, are old-fashioned. And it's not that that's an unusual viewpoint. I'm sure you said the same thing to your parents. But again, we were undergoing this massive technological revolution. So for him to say that people needed to, like, you know, get with the times um, is, is kind of a, a bold thing to say. So he's saying things are different, man. Like this, this traditionalism that you've been holding on to is no longer valid. So the next big question is, OK, if we're going to, like, get on board with capitalism, um, we need to change the way that we do business. So part of the spirit of capitalism is maximum profit, right? And part of maximum profit is not losing too much money paying your employees. 
employees are very expensive. Um, so the goal is always to secure the greatest possible amount of work from his men. Um, so you want to get as much work, as much labor out of people as possible while still paying them the smallest amount possible. So one option for this um, is what's called piece rate pay. So piece rate pay is essentially that, you know, there's a rate of money you earn for every piece. Um, so for instance, if you were mowing grass, let's say you got paid, you know, per acre mowed. Um, or if you were making shirts, you know, per shirt made. Um, so if you're doing piecemeal or sorry, piece rate pay, you, you pay only when they have finished a product. So he thought, well, maybe this will work. Maybe this uh, will encourage people to make more stuff so that they can earn more money. But he found that that wasn't necessarily the case. He found that people basically worked as much as they needed to to earn as much as they felt like they needed. Um, he said the opportunity of earning more was less attractive than that of working less. He did not ask, how much can I earn in a day if I do as much work as possible? But instead, how much must I work in order to earn the wage which I earned beforehand and which takes care of my needs? So, you know, essentially, how much work do I have to do to survive? Uh, people, he thought, were not interested in doing more work for more money. They just wanted to do enough work uh, until they could leave. And uh, this may sound familiar to you. The second option was just to lower the wages. Um, so here you would ask for the same amount of work out of people, but you would, you would lessen the money that you paid them. So he says, low wages and high profits seem even today to a superficial observer to stand in correlation. Everything which is paid out in wages seems to involve a corresponding reduction in profits. So you can imagine this as a very simple graph, right? Like as wages go up, profits go down. As profits go up, wages go down. Um, and again, a time-honored tradition. If you pay your people as little as possible, you stand to make as much profit as possible. However, um, this doesn't always turn out well. So one reason it might not turn out well should sound familiar. This one comes from uh, Smith, and that's the idea that if you don't pay people enough, uh, they're going to be hungry and they're going to be physically unwell. He says the efficiency of labor decreases with a wage which is physiologically insufficient. Um, so one way you may have heard this phrase is like you have to pay people enough to keep their souls in their bodies, um, and that's what he's talking about. And again, this is what Adam Smith talked about. Um, the minimum wage should be enough to support a man, his wife, their two children. And here he's talking about sort of the same thing. The minimum wage should be enough to where the person isn't sick and they're not hungry and they're doing okay. Um, so his argument is if you pay people too little, they're going to be physiologically insufficient. They're going to be physiologically incapable of doing the work. The second thing is that some jobs require, um, you know, skilled workers. It requires a very specific skill set. Um, and if you spend a lot of time learning how to do something specialized and you do a lot of training learning how to do something uh, and you spend a lot of time, you know, practicing and perfecting your craft, that kind of labor does not come cheap. Uh, people who have put a lot of effort into their education and their training expect to be paid a lot. You know, it, it's, again, a sort of a correlated thing. So if you want to hire skilled laborers, you have to be prepared to pay skilled laborers. So it doesn't work in that situation. And the final circumstance, um, again, may also sound familiar to you, um, which is that some jobs require what he calls a developed sense of responsibility. Um, and in that sense, he's saying sometimes you need people who take that job very seriously um, and who feel very responsible for it. And if you want people to, to take their job as seriously as possible, sometimes you have to pay them in a way that reflects that. Um, so you've probably seen this if you've ever, I think a lot of you were talking about going to that McDonald's in Brookhaven, and sometimes they would just close uh, because they weren't paying the people enough to be there. And that's very much this, uh, this idea that people will care about their job as much as you paid them to care about their job. Um, so this idea of like, well, I don't get paid enough to bother with that. That's this. Um, if you want people to care, you have to pay them. And that means that you have to raise your wages instead of lowering them, which is, of course, against capitalism. So that brings us to the real solution, which is that you can't uh, tie labor solely to wages. You have to tie labor to something more intrinsic. So he says, labor must, on the contrary, be performed as if it were an absolute end in itself, a calling. So essentially, you need to do your job as though it was like your life's work to do that job. But such an attitude is by no means a product of nature. It cannot be evoked by low wages or high ones alone but can only be the product of a long and arduous process of education. So 
giving people low wages is not going to make them work hard. Sometimes giving people high wages is not going to make them work hard. What's going to make them work hard is the fundamental belief that they're supposed to be working hard or that good people work hard. Um, so he's saying it's a, it's a long and arduous process. you got to start when they're babies. you got to start with this capitalist ethos, this idea that the best people are the hardest workers. Um, and so this begins the series of Let's Get This Bread memes Oh, I love them so much. Uh, but I think this is a really modern way to express that, this idea that we are obligated to get the bread, that the best person gets the bread. Um, so this is sort of where this idea begins. It's not enough to pay people. It's not enough to educate people. You have to train the people to believe that working is their calling. So now he questions... Well, what's stopping people from doing this? Uh, why don't people just automatically feel like their work is their calling? So he goes a little bit backwards in history to look at some examples. Um, and he essentially goes back to this idea of inherent laziness, <laughs> or more perhaps a sort of in, inherent um, contentedness. But he argues that people don't, by nature, want more money. He says a man does not, quote, by nature, wish to earn more and more money, but simply to live as he is accustomed to live and to earn as much as is necessary for that purpose. So he says that, that most people, most of the time, and again, he's talking about, quote, traditionalist people, which is like a sort of a low-key insult, but essentially that these these kind of lazy traditionalist people don't want to work hard and accumulate wealth. They want to do as much work as they have to and then chill. Uh, that they, they are only going to work as hard as they need to to just sort of maintain. He goes so far as to sort of illustrate what a day in their life might look like. And he says, earnings were moderate, enough to lead a respectable life and in good times put away a little a long daily visit to the tavern with often plenty to drink and a congenial circle of friends made life comfortable and leisurely. And the thing that has always struck me as weird about this part of the reading is that that sounds nice. <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, I know that's not what we're supposed to think when we read that. We're supposed to look at those people and think like, oh, how provincial, you know, like, nah, how old fashioned. But um, I wonder if we're not headed sort of back in that direction. Um, a lot of people... Are, are sort of arguing that we should do this, that this whole live to work thing is, is killing us and it's unpleasant and we should stop, that we should go back to this way of life uh, where we had enough money, sometimes we had enough money to save, and also we had community. We had time in our day to hang out and drink. We had time to maintain friendships. We had time for leisure. Um, he's arguing that that is you know, backwards and old-fashioned, but I don't know, you guys, I think I might be arguing that it's nice. So he kind of completes this argument with this assessment of people only doing as much work as they need to do. Um, and this is, you know, this is him repeating the argument, but he wants to get it out of the way. Um, so he argues essentially you, you do as much work as you need to get the profit that you need. Um, like, why would you kill five deer if you're only going to eat two deer? You know, that'd be kind of ridiculous. Or similarly, why would you work 80 hours if you can survive on 40 hours? He's saying that it isn't necessarily rational to do more work than you have to. This may sound kind of familiar to some of you. <laughs> um, I've, I hear this all the time at the end of the semester, people saying, oh, well, how much do I need on the final, you know, to get an A or whatever? Uh, this idea that you might spend more time calculating the bare minimum you need to pass than you, than you spend studying, um, especially now that they're offering this uh, pass-fail option. So this idea that you're only going to do as much work as you need to to get the result that you want, very human. So the change that happens is, again, this, like, big picture cultural change. It's the Industrial Revolution change. So he says, at some time, this leisureliness was suddenly destroyed. So the Industrial Revolution itself was sort of a, a slow roll, a slow burn, but basically he illustrates how it came to change people's lives on an interpersonal level. So very often what happened, and this is true and this is still true, is that one you know, young entrepreneur, one young person would look at the system and be like, you know, I bet I could do this more efficiently. Um, they might consolidate the process. So they make the shirt and sell the shirt in the same place. Uh, they might change the marketing style so that they sell a shirt to men and women. Um, they might sort of introduce a new way of paying people so that they end up with a large employee turnover, but that allows them to pay employees very little, which allows them to make a bigger profit. 
Um, and ultimately, if they end up making a big profit, um, they might be able to expand and expand and expand until they drive everyone else out of business. And he is laying out this argument in a way that makes it sound kind of dark. But if you look, um, again, historically, especially a lot of businesses in America, this has definitely been the thing, right? Like, even if we just look at, like, Amazon, they used to just sell books. Now they sell everything. And part of that is because they consolidated the process. Um, you know, you can buy the book and have the book shipped to you at the same time. Um, you can buy the book and listen to the audio at the same time now. Uh, you can skip the book entirely and watch the movie. All of that is still Amazon now. Um, they changed their marketing styles. They introduced low prices. We know for a fact they have large employee turnover. And consequently, everyone else is out of business. So this is a time-honored way to take a business from like a mom-and-pop shop to a global conglomerate. Um, and remember, Vapor is describing this more than 100 years ago. So this is the beginning of that process. This is the beginning of the shift from like, you know, working a little bit and chilling the rest of the time to work, 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 work. And the, again, massive part of the shift was that everybody was like emotionally on board. Um, that people at the time, I mean, to be fair, of course, they were kind of, you know, you know, kind of shit talking it. At the same time, they weren't. And that was what was the big deal, this, this new spirit. What is most important in this connection was not generally in such cases a stream of new money that was invested in the industry, which brought about this revolution, but this new spirit, the spirit of modern capitalism. So it's not enough that you have the opportunity to expand. You have to also have the will to expand. Or it's not enough that you are content to have a high employee turnover. You also have to um, have the will to believe that that's the right thing. So again, the way that we enacted this major shift was believing that we should. Uh, the, the Getting the culture behind it, super, super important. The spirit of capitalism. So I think it's, again, important to know that sometimes when we talk about history like this, um, we don't talk about the fact that a lot of people were not on board. Um, and this is true of almost every major social change. These things happen. We can't always control it. But it's important to remember that even at the time, people didn't like it. Um, he uses this fabulously understated sentence. Its entry on the scene was generally, or sorry, was not generally peaceful. Um, which is just such a beautiful way to describe an epic social change that people hated. It was not generally peaceful. I do love a bit of a, a, a bit of an understatement. So this this shift to the capitalist ethic, hmm, not generally peaceful. Um, one of the things that he notices in terms of how the shift is working out is that it isn't necessarily working for everybody. Uh, not every single person is imbued with the spirit of capitalism. And one of the things that he notices is that people who do have the spirit of capitalism tend to come from relatively similar backgrounds. So he's noticing that often the people who are, as you might say, the thirstiest um, are the people who need that money the most. He says men who had grown up in the hard school of life calculating and daring at the same time, above all, temperate and reliable, shrewd and completely devoted to their business with strictly bourgeois opinions and principles. So he's not saying it's um, the, the landed elite, the wealthy elite who are having all the success. He's saying it's people who had a sort of a rough beginning and therefore are determined to climb up that ladder, people who are calculating. Um, and now these people are also very daring. They're taking business ventures. But at the same time, they're participating in capitalism in a very shrewd way. They're not betting. Uh, they're not, you know, staking their whole fortune on one small thing. They're thinking about this carefully and logically. These people are temperate. Uh, and moreover, these people are devoted. So, Again, this may sort of sound familiar if you think about um, people that you know in your own life or even if you think about um, people in, in the music that you might listen to. On the left here, we see little baby Jay-Z. Um, I think he's a great example of someone who grew up in the hard school, but through calculation, uh, through devotion, through very shrewd business dealings, ended up at the top. And, and it's always been possible, but it became more possible in the Industrial Revolution because you really could, you know, start from the bottom. So what he's looking at here is the way that we start and the way that we end up, and that the connecting factor that he finds is the willingness, the capitalist spirit, like this, um, I think you might call it like this hustle. And one of the things that he notices is that people who have that hustle, who have that drive, 
um, are, are restless and they're never satisfied. Like it's not enough to make one really good business deal. Um, they have to make a new business deal every day. They have to make a new one every week. And one of the things that he starts to question is like, yeah, okay, but why? What's going on? And the sort of bottomless void you have. And the answer that he finds that people give, I think is fascinating because we still hear people say this all the time. So he says, if you ask them, what is the meaning of their restless activity? Why are they never satisfied with what they have, thus appearing so senseless to any purely worldly view of life? They would perhaps give the answer, if they knew of any at all, to provide for my children and grandchildren. And again, this should sound familiar. Uh, we hear people say this all the time. Like, well, why are you working so hard? And they say, well, I want to take care of my family. Uh, or they say, well, I, I don't want my kids to struggle like I struggled. So this idea of it being sort of a selfless process is relatively common. Um, whether you believe it or not is a whole different problem. But basically, why people have that drive, he thinks, well, maybe it's because they want to provide for their progeny. But... He thinks that might not really be it. Um, they might say that it's because they want to take care of their children, but he thinks it goes a little bit deeper than that and perhaps a little bit more individual than that. And he thinks that it might just be because it has become such a part of our life that we don't know how to let go. But more often, uh, and since that motive is not peculiar to them, but was just as effective for the traditionalist, more correctly, simply, that business with its continuous work has become a necessary part of their lives. So this is something that I encourage you to look at, um, you know, in your in your personal life, to look at your parents, to look at the people around you. Does it seem to you that their work is a necessary part of their lives? Is their identity tied up in their work? Um, is their you know sense of self tied up in the act of being a hard worker? Um, and that's not an unusual thing to see, you know, especially in our, in our modern capitalistic world. This idea that continuous work is a necessary part of our lives um, for some people. You have to work continuously because that's how much you need to work to earn. For some people, you have to work continuously because that's an important part of your, your view of yourself. Um, you know, for some people, you have to work continuously because other people expect you to. And so he's essentially arguing that it's not just about the money. It's about this need to be busy, this need to be good, um, and that even when we're exhausted, we still go to work. Um, and again, Look at this quote pretty hard. Like, roll this one around in your brain. Like, really think about this one, because what he's arguing here is that working is a necessary part of our lives. Not in the sense that we're earning, but in the sense that that's a, just a massive part of who we are and what we do. Like, we just expect people to be working. So he notices um, that basically... We used to think of money as necessary, but now we think of business as necessary. Um, so this may sound familiar if you're familiar with the work of Snoop Doggy Dog, who I believe just goes by Snoop Dogg now. Um, but Weber says, business with its continuous work has become a necessary part of their lives. Man exists for the sake of his business instead of the reverse. Whereas Snoop Dogg says, my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Same Z's. Same sees. Basically, Weber is arguing that instead of working to live, we are living to work, um, and that this is a dramatic social change. And again, this is why we teach Weber, uh, because he is the first person to sort of write this down. So you don't necessarily need to agree with all of the stuff that he said um, about religion and about traditionalism and about change, but I do think it's important that we acknowledge that he was right about this shift, that we began to exist for the sake of our, of our work instead of um, working as much as we had to to go home to our families. When the imagination of a whole people has once been turned towards purely quantitative bigness, as in the United States, this romanticism of numbers exercises an irresistible appeal to the poets among businessmen. So if you know any Wall Street bros, this is it. Uh, this idea that, that Americans are just in love with quantitative bigness. We want to know how big is your house? How much does your car cost? Like, what's your annual income? Um, how, what does your watch tell me about your earning? Like, Americans love to quantitate things. We love to, to have, like, a, a number on how well somebody is doing. And essentially, we romanticize these numbers. We attach these numbers to self-worth. We attach these numbers to personal value. Um, 
one of the ways that we see this very often is in the dating scene. And, you know, this is this is why we're so obsessed with men having jobs. Um, we have this romanticism of numbers. We don't we don't want men who don't have jobs. In my generation, we called them scrubs. There's a whole song. I'm sure you've heard it. Um, I don't know what you guys call it. Uh, but this is kind of that idea. Like, there's entirely separate dating apps just for people who earn a certain amount of money. Like, th this idea that the, the quantitative amount um, of, of anything is valuable kind of starts here, this romanticism of numbers. He does just for a minute, remember that this is not necessarily always the case. Um, historically, we have not been so obsessed with this, but the way that he phrases it um, is really interesting, I think. So he says, that anyone should be able to make it the sole purpose of his life work to sink into the grave weighted down with a great material load of money and goods seems to him explicable only as the product of a perverse instinct. The Ari Sacra Famas, um, which is uh, Latin, and it essentially means like the accursed need for gold. Um, and it, so what he's talking about is this pervasive sense that money is more important than anything else. Um, and he's saying it, it is weird. Religion usually doesn't tell us that. Culture usually doesn't tell us that. Um, this idea that we want to die rich is, is kind of weird. And he argues it is, in fact, a perverse instinct. So again, he sees it arising and dismisses it at the same time. The problem uh, with dismissing it is that if you do dismiss this need for gold, if you do dismiss this capital ethic, um, you're going to suffer because you have to participate in order to survive in the American economy, uh, or at this point, to survive in the post-industrial economy. So he says, the capitalistic system so needs this devotion to the calling of making money it is an attitude toward material goods which is so well suited to that system, so intimately bound up with the conditions of survival and the economic struggle for existence, that there can no longer be any question of a necessary connection of that acquisi uh, sorry, acquisitive manner of life. So he's saying capitalism requires a devotion to making money um, and economic survival requires capitalism. So essentially, you, you can't really participate in the modern economy unless you participate in this, unless you participate in this devotion to making money, unless you agree that you're going to make this bread, or sorry, get this bread, um, probably until the day that you die. Like, you, you have to buy into this system. Because whosoever does not adapt this manner of life to the conditions of capitalistic success must go under, or at least cannot rise. So if you choose not to participate in capitalism, you can, uh, but you're kind of screwed, right? Like if you don't have a job, how are you going to pay for things? How are you going to live, you know? So this idea of participate or else, um, he's just hammering that home. He said this already once. I don't know why this chapter is a little bit repetitive, but he wants to really hammer this idea home. Uh, participate or get the fuck out. So the question becomes, since this book is ostensibly about the Protestant ethic, how does this, this spirit of capitalism mesh with religion? Um, and the answer is that it kind of doesn't. Um, almost all religions you know, refrain from advocating for the accumulation of wealth. He says, for that the conception of money-making as an end in itself to which people were bound as a calling was contrary to the ethical feelings of the whole ethics. It is hardly necessary to prove. So he's basically saying, like, I don't even need to tell you that this is weird. Like, this idea that making money is a calling is weird. It hasn't existed before, and frankly, I barely need to tell you that. Um, and in part, this is because none of the sects of Christianity, until relatively recently, advocated wealth. Uh, Protestantism has, has long been very clear um, that you don't need to accumulate money in order to be a good Christian. So this uh, lack of relationship between wealth and Christianity might sound familiar to some of you. Um, there are several places uh, in, the, in the Christian Bible, especially in the New Testament, um, where wealth is shown perhaps as even a bad thing. Um, for instance, of course, in Luke, uh, Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And this is something that you hear repeated a lot. Um, so if you remember from the lecture last week, we were talking about the relationship between religiosity and income. 
And one of the things that we saw is that religion is very popular among the poorest countries and the poorest people. And that's why these verses are so popular. That's a major, I think, reason why we hear them repeated so often and often and often. Um, you hear a lot of stuff about, like, you can't serve God and money. Um, or if you long to be rich, you'll never get of all that you want. You know, there's there's a lot of very specifically anti-capitalist messages uh, in, in the New Testament. My personal favorite that I was kind of obsessed with as a child um, was this part about the, the camel. Uh, it says, I'll, I'll say it again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, so when I was little, I was very worried about the camel and the needle. And I was like, what if you made a really big needle? Or like, what if you made a really small camel? And I spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, which is evidence that I was missing the point of the story. I was a very literal child. Um, but basically, they're saying that the, the accumulation of wealth is not the mark of a good Christian. Uh, you know, that good work is the mark of a good Christian. So the fact that this this modern version of Calvinism, of Protestantism, was able to connect wealth and religiosity uh, was deeply unusual. And for the record, um, they were just emerging from a very tricky point in time for the Catholic Church. Um, so the whole Protestant Revolution was really only, you know, a century or two before this happened. And before the Protestant Revolution, the Catholic Church was up to all sorts of weirdness. Um, if you've ever studied uh, the Medicis or the Borgias, um, or if you're interested in, like, you know, pretty trashy uh, dramas on TV, there's plenty of them to watch. Uh, but basically, the Catholic Church and the popes especially um, had gone through a period of a pretty sketchy relationship with capitalism. Um, you know, you could pay for indulgences. Uh, you could get people out of hell by paying more for them. Um, you could pay people to pray for you. Uh, you could make a special donation to the church for, uh, you know, like a very special reason. Like, it, it, it was very clear that there was a lot of bribery uh, involved and a, and a complete lack of, you know, religious consideration. So that was one of the reasons that Catholicism had lost so much popularity. The direct relationship uh, between Catholicism and capitalism was not good, not ideal, and people did not care for it. So one of the ways that he sort of talks about this um, is this idea of gifts. So he says, even skeptics and people indifferent to the church often reconciled themselves with it by gifts because it was a sort of insurance against the uncertainties of what might come after death. So here he's saying that even people who, who weren't sure that religion was real or that God was real would, like, buy their way into it just in case. Uh, like, you know, they would donate a certain amount of money to the church um, or to one of the members of the church. You know, like, no, oh, just in case, because nobody knows what happens when you die. Like, might as well spend some money if you're going to get into heaven later. But the issue that we're seeing now um, is that capitalism has surpassed uh, its, its need for religion. That, that now that Catholicism was sort of on the decline uh, and Protestantism was on the rise, um, capitalism and religion didn't need necessarily to be tied together. He says, in fact, it no longer needs the support of any religious forces and feels the attempts of religion to influence economic life to be as much an unjustified interference as its regulation by the state. So essentially, you shouldn't use your religion to influence um, the economy, similar to the way that you shouldn't use your government to influence the economy, both of which we did not, you know, keep as Americans. But essentially, he's arguing capitalism doesn't even need religion anymore. So now we get to the real meat of this. Uh, now we get to the sort of overarching explanation of everything that he's trying to say. So he starts with a very important question. What was the background of ideas which could account for the sort of activity apparently directed toward profit alone as a calling toward which the individual feels himself to have an ethical obligation? Like, essentially, why have people suddenly started deciding that um, their life needs to be devoted to the earning of money? And the answer, you'll not be surprised, gigantic social change. Yes, see, I told you it would all come back. We're circling right back around to the beginning. So I know I've been harping and harping on the Industrial Revolution, but here it is. This is what happened. Uh, because of all of these massive social shifts, we were able to shift our idea about work. So we started having, for the first time ever, work as your identity. Your family is not your identity anymore. Nobody knows who your daddy is and what he does. Your work is your identity. 
And if you have a lot of money, it must mean that you're good at your work and it must mean that you're therefore a good person. And moreover, there's always, always more work to do. Like if you think about, um, you know, perhaps you were a butcher, you could only butcher as many cows as, you know, you had available. But if you work in a factory and the factory runs 24 hours a day, in theory, you could work indefinitely. You know, there's always more work to be done. There's always more money to be made. It's a never ending yawning void. So the way that essentially the Industrial Revolution changed the way that we think about jobs is that it made it compulsory. It made it not optional anymore. Not only do you have to work, but you should also believe that working is an important part of your identity and that working is an important part um, of, of your calling. Like you, you are doing this because you're a good person. So at this point, this should sound familiar, uh, Basically, the whole course has been about the way that the Industrial Revolution changed the way we thought about jobs, and this is where it ends. This idea that now your work is your identity. So this is where the major shift between religion and capitalism occurs. Basically, the things that we used to value about a person who was religious are now the things that we value about a person who is wealthy. Uh, we like people who work hard. Um, this is where, you know, how people are always talking about like, oh, I stayed up so late and oh, I've worked so many hours and, oh, you know, I closed and then opened again. You know, like people are obsessed with doing hard work and telling other people about their hard work. Um, we're also obsessed with success, of course. Like if you think about, you know, if you hear a mother bragging about their child, they don't brag about how kind they are. They brag about where they went to college and what kind of job they have now. You know, this, this earning of money is just deeply important to us. It's a huge part of the American dream. Um, and not just earning money, but like compiling it, turning it into capital, turning it into wealth, turning it into privilege. And if you can do all of that, you will be beloved and popular. So in previous generations, we looked at all of these um, sort of factors here, and we used them to measure how good a person was based on religion. But now we look at all of these factors here and we use them to measure how good a person is based on wealth. So essentially religion and capitalism have done a swap. Uh, and now, as you can see in this meme that I made all by myself, uh, Protestants are more interested in capitalism than they are in religion. So that's it. That's not only the last lecture of the uh, semester, actually. It's sort of the, the last point that I wanted to make in this class as a whole. This idea that we have, we have really decided that money and our job is sort of the source of our happiness, the source of our identity. And that's why um, America is the way that it is. The end.